Workers who say they were blacklisted by building companies have won millions in compensation after a long-running legal battle finally ended. 256 building workers who were blacklisted by some of Britain's biggest construction firms are now going to share more than 10 million quid in compensation. I worked that out as about £40,000 each. The blacklist is believed to have been in use for 30 years and it was used by dozens of well-known construction firms to vet those applying for work on their building sites. It resulted in hundreds of workers losing their jobs and then being unable to secure new ones after being deemed troublemakers, often because they simply raised legitimate workplace issues about safety or pay. The list included details of workers' political views, competence and trade union activities. We'd love to know if this has affected you or your family. We're going to speak to somebody who was blacklisted very shortly. Do call 0500 288 291, email vine at bbc.co.uk. Let's speak first to the BBC's industry correspondent, John Moylan. So 30 years this went on. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Uh, It had long been claimed that blacklisting was rife on construction sites right across uh, Britain, that people, particularly in trade unions, when they they raised health and safety concerns, when they raised concerns on, on sites, they were being regarded as troublemakers and they then found it hard to get employment again. The big breakthrough came in 2009 with the discovery of a list. Uh, There was a raid by the Information Commissioner's Office on a premises in Droitwich in Worcestershire, which found a database that found a list of names with a series of reference cards. And as you say, the reference cards contain these extraordinary details of individuals, trade union activities, sometimes their personal relationships, their political activities, etc. Also with press cuttings and a recommendation in some cases of whether to employ them or not. So they discovered a list. Attempts were made to find these people. When they found them, some of them settled with the firms early. Around 800 took cases to the High Court. And in the last couple of weeks, um, those cases have been settled. And now for the first time, we've got a sense of the kind of the sums involved in all of this. So this was a, a company that was operating with the front door and everything else. And it was keeping it well, not on a computer, but on cards, was it? It was a card-based system back then. Yeah, exactly. It was 2009. But the history of this is extraordinary. So the Consulting Association... Uh, had been started in 1993. So this had been going on for some time. But actually, it was started using a pre-existing list that existed from an organisation called the Economic League, which was a sort of a a pro-free free enterprise outfit. And that list dated back to the 70s when there was an upsurge of industrial activity on building sites and actually in other parts of, of industry too. So the list had existed in different forms for many, many decades and several thousand people were covered by it. And if you were on it, you were on it because you were in a trade union or just sometimes more, even more subtle than that? Normally it was because of your trade union activity. When they uncovered the list, they found it had private information like your national insurance number, um, in some cases info on personal relationships, trade union membership. It said if you'd been involved in disputes, if you'd made complaints about working conditions, like health and safety uh, concerns. There were comments written in some of these cards. Uh, person will cause trouble, strong trade union uh, member, ex-shop steward, definite problems uh, were, some, were some of the comments and recommendations of whether to, to hire or not. So this was a secret list that workers had no ability to challenge whatsoever. And often the comments made on it were defamatory. And the information was being provided into the list by construction firms. And construction firms were then using that same list. They would ring in and they would vet an individual against them. And, and if you were the individual, you might not even know why you didn't get the job, I guess. Of course not. No, it was a secret list. So people must have been affected for, for years by it. Well, there were, there were 3,100 names on the list. Unions claim that the raid only uncovered part of the list. There could have been many, many more. As I said, 800 were involved in the High Court case. So clearly, you know, hundreds of people were affected by this possibly thousand. And, you know, the the personal impact is that they were denied work, which will have hit their earnings and their personal circumstances, their personal lives. You know, in some cases, I've been told by unions that it led to issues like alcoholism. Um, And I know of one worker, for example, that had to go abroad to get work because he could no, no longer find work here. Thank you very much, John Moylan, BBC industry correspondent. Let's hear more about the personal impact from Leslie James, who's an electrician. Hi, Leslie. Hello. I should say you were an electrician. You were blacklisted in 72, so it's quite a long time ago. Well, I, I, I don't know when I was blacklisted, but all I do know, you know, because this is uh, denied by the government of the day, 
that any blacklist would uh, is in, in operation in this country. He went to Parliament about it, uh, see the MPs, and they denied anything that anything like this is happening at all. Uh, but on my personal self, I was working on a cons- on a site, uh, a chemical plant when they built it in Bagland Bay in uh, in the sixties uh, to the seventies, and when the contract ended, and um, we had to find uh, new employment. I wrote to various companies, and uh, and at the time, you know, I believe it was in '72, they were uh, starting to build uh, the IRO offices in Lanish and Cardiff, the Inland Revenue, and I applied for a job there with a company called Matthew Hall, and I had a, co- a contracts of employment forward on to me from Matthew Halls of S- uh, Southampton to start the following Monday and when I arrived at the site on that particular Monday morning the agent for Matthew Hall told me oh you're not starting yet Ah, so did did you say to him look hang on I've got a contract Yes I showed him the contract from the head office in Southampton and he made all excuses under the world to deny us entry onto the site and we said, well, that's not right because we got the, you know, we, we, some people have uh, packed in jobs elsewhere to come here to work because that contract was, uh, I believe at the time, was about a four-year contract and it had been very suitable for myself considering that I lived in Cardiff. And we were denied it. And we went down to Newport Road to our ETU office to see our representative for the ETU. Um, the trade union? The trade union, the electoral trade union. Yeah. We went there and uh, told him what's happened, and he got in touch with Matthew Hall of Southampton. Uh, we had to wait for an hour or two, and he came back. He said, sorry, but uh, the, you can't have a ch- job there. So now, uh, did you suspect you had been blacklisted or did you at the time have no knowledge of this list? No knowledge whatsoever. So you're left then thinking that this is an almighty mystery. It was at the time because uh, why it came more in a week week or so later, they were employing electricians at the IRO offices in Lanishan. So I said, well... They employ people, yet we've been issued with a contract of employment, the terms and conditions of the site, which is a standard thing, uh, and we were denied work. Now, now, do you know why you went on the list? No. Was no, it because you, you I know you, you did a bit of health and safety? Yes, well, on Bagland Bay, there was, a, uh, there was about 650 men. On our, in our contract. I worked at uh, uh, Matthew Holtz. And uh, and you represent them from cabin to cabin. Uh, I wasn't the shop steward. I was just on the committee of the of it uh, yeah, of it. And uh, they come to me in the cabin at bridge time. Uh, different electricians and uh, men who work for us complained about aspects of the site. And uh, I would go forward and I go into the agent to see the agent and. Uh, explain to him uh, you know he'd probably try and rectify some of the problems and some of the problems he couldn't rectify uh, so that's is where he went and it, it went on like this for a, a numerous years so, so you, well, you must have you had a young family didn't you Leslie yes I had two young children and you, you're then struggling to uh, put food on the table I'm guessing well that's correct yeah because we couldn't find employment we had to take uh well, find work, whatever you could find work, you know. Did you have to think about going abroad? That was later on uh, when I, I got a job as a, uh, on, a, on the ships uh, doing seaco maintenance. And could you, is there, at what point did you, did the light bulb go on and you thought, that, wait a minute, this can't be just one job after another falling away. S- somebody somewhere is controlling this. Well, uh, it was uh, McAlpine's, Lord McAlpine. Uh-huh. Robert, he... He was like the head uh, of the sites, you know. He, 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 and we were subcontractors to McAlpine's in some, firm, you know, in some jobs, not all of them, 
but uh, he was the instigator of the blacklist because uh, uh, it was a secret society through the uh, construction industry, and the chap who kept the uh, the blacklist uh, in his offices, he he died uh, not long ago, and uh, his wife took over the business, and the IHCO raided his offices to look there, and they found this blacklist with 3,200 names on it. And yours was there? And I, it was in the Daily Mirror one day back uh, a few years ago, asking, would you, consider, would you think you would have been on this blacklist? And it gave you a number to phone, uh, Philip Reed of the G GMB, and I rang him and he, I gave him my name and my national insurance number, etc., my date of birth, and he came back within five minutes. Oh, yes, he said, you're on top of the list, you. Amazing. Leslie James, thank you very much. And then, next thing I know, uh, Days of London, uh, uh, they were the lawyers employed by the GM to uh, take it further. And, and I was found not guilty in the High Courts of London. Well, thank you. And I know you're getting compensation. Leslie James, thank you. Electrician who was blacklisted in 1972, talking about the list and the compensation. And there was a, a great piece about all this in The Guardian because they kind of broke the story about this business of blacklisting the trade union members. And they went into the files and they, they found the kinds of things that were written about the builders. So here's a couple of phrases for you. This one. Will cause trouble. Strong trade unionist. Or this. Ex-shop steward. Definite problems. Or even... Irish, ex-army, bad egg. And one person who was blacklisted was David Lackford and his son, Kestine Bruce, or Kestine... Sorry, I was going to say son, I suddenly thought Kestine could be a daughter. I'm sorry. Yeah, daughter. Yeah, forgive me. How are you doing? Not too bad, thank you. And, and your dad then died of an industrial disease as well. Yeah, he died um, 18 months ago of mesothelioma, which was also contracted through his job um, when he was an apprentice electrician. Um, so, yeah, he's, unfortunately he's not here today to see the result. Yeah, and he would have been compensated because it sounds like he he was put on this list because he took part in a, sp a strike, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Um, he was working on the Jubilee Line extension. Uh -huh. He was always encouraged to be a union member. And um, they were instructed to strike, which he did, and he never worked in that industry again, and we had no idea why. It was a devastating effect on our family. Um, he went from a well-paid, regular job, um, he'd never been out of work, um, to obviously no money. I believe he had about two years out of work, and finally he got um, a job as working for the local council, actually digging graves. Um, and that's what he did up until he retired. What did that do, do for his self-esteem? Um, it was a very difficult time. I was about 15. I remember um, my mum and dad were sort of really struggling money-wise. There was no money to put food on the table. And my mum kept on saying to my dad, I can't understand why you're not getting work. You know, all these people are... All these contacts are ringing you and saying we've got definite starts on Monday. Just give the foreman a ring. He was doing that, and then no one would ever call him back. And and presumably for you, as for the last guest, Kestine, you there's then this story in the Mirror, and then the Information Commissioner raids the office in Droitwich, and suddenly the penny drops. Mm, exactly, and um, I think the solicitor contacted my mother in, in the end, and. Um, when we confirmed, yeah, that he was at, he was on this list. So, how are you feeling today? Um, I'm glad at the result. Um, I just wish he'd be. I think he would have um, been so happy to realise that you know he had not following instructions, and he w we were penalised in the worst way for it. Thanks, Kirsty, and have a great day. All Thank right. you. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. John is in, it says here, in Scotland, I'm not sure where, says, I've been on this blacklist for 22 years. I'll be receiving £35,000 in compensation. Loads of construction workers, including me, were forced to go abroad. I've earned less money as a result, and it's affected my relationships negatively. So we've heard about some of the 
personal pain there. And and Castine's father obviously ends up digging graves for the council, but he's an electrician. It's not what he trained to do. James Wardle in Newcastle, Emlyn, you were locked up for an offence at one point. <clears throat> yes. And is that how it all started? Um, no, it started when um, uh, we occupied the colliery, Sanger Colliery, near Deal in Kent. Okay, and then that was in the minus strike? Yes. yes. And then in prison you trained to be a bricklayer? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and then so you, just take us through it. You started a company when you got out of prison. Well, no, initially I went into a cooperative that was formed by fellow um, sacked miners. And then um, when um, the, the cooperative more or less went to a, a halt, I ended up, the only way I could get work was to um, form my own little company. Uh, are we only talking me occasionally another guy? Sure. <laughs> so so at what point did you think you were on the blacklist or was it somebody you hired? Oh, I, I knew as soon as I came out, I was because when I was in prison, um, the blacklist had already cut in against all my um, friends from um, the Betsanger Colliery and Tilmerston and Snow. Two col uh, colliers and coal miners were... Um, we are blacklisted and we couldn't get unemployment benefit and nothing. Once your number was on that list, you finished. Mm. And the blacklist was headed up by the Freedom Association, based in Dunfermline at the time, and headed by Norman Tebbit. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to... You said Norman Tebbit, and I'm just thinking, I haven't heard his name in connection with it, so that might be questionable. <laughs> Uh, no, actually it's not. It was proven through um, uh, the lots of um, inquiries made by uh, by the political side of it at the time, and um, his he was a strong tie to it because uh, he was uh, Margaret Thatcher's um, assistant, shall we say? But in term, so in, just to get to the heart of this, you you had this little company, and then you employed someone who was on the blacklist. Yes. It. Yeah, yes. and then you were found out you were blacklisted as well. He was blacklisted, and um, when we went to the channel to um, do a, a subcontract job, um, we were escorted off site because his number, um, his national insurance number, came up on the blacklist. And when I rang the major um, contractor, he said to me, you, um, one of your operatives is blacklisted. And uh -huh. I said, well, how do I actually get in touch with this blacklist thing? And they told me, it's a Dunfermline number. You can actually pay money into it on an annual basis as a company, and we will provide a blacklist of any person in the UK. All you have to do is ring up, give us their national insurance number. She says, I used to be in the construction industry. In the 1980s, I was blacklisted from working on submarines in Glasgow because I had been a member of the CND when I was 15. Speaking of the 1980s... Every week, BBC Radio 2 brings you the finest the 80s has to offer with Sounds of the 80s. I'm Sarah Cox, and our next show has not just the sounds, but the sights of the 80s as well. I play the hits. Hello. You watch the videos. The best thing about doing Sounds of the 80s on the telly box is that people get to think back to those hazy days where big hair was encouraged and my very special guest is possibly the nicest man in music level 42's mark king bbc radio 2's sounds of the 80s with me sarah cox watch by pressing the red button from any bbc tv channel and while we're on the subject we have the sounds of the 80s volume 2 cd out yep there are still cds in the world and this is recorded for us